Every single time you turn on the mainstream financial media, you hear the same thing. The stock market is once again at all-time highs. We've got a record high in the Nasdaq. We've got the S&P closing in on its own record high. But I'm sure a lot of you are watching this and saying to yourself, okay, at some point this has to come to an end. We're in a massive bubble and stocks will decline, if not outright crash. So the question becomes when is this likely to happen? I'm gonna answer this for you in one simple fast step. Step number one, to know what's going to happen in the future, we have to understand what has happened in the past. And when we look at history, a chart going all the way back to 1990 to right around 2000, we'll call it 11, 12, and this is the S&P 500 in nominal terms. On the left, we go from 200 up to 1800. In 1990, we were right around, well, let's call it 300, 350. And in 2000, or in the, in the 1990s rather, it just goes parabolic to the point where in 2000, it was up near 1600. But then the dot-com bubble bursts. And that parabolic move takes the elevator down. <laughs> but then we start to go back up. And you'll notice usually in these bull markets, the stock market itself kind of takes the stairs up, but it takes the elevator down, just like we saw during the GFC. And on the S&P 500, we get to this weird number right around 666. I don't know what that means. So what we really have to focus on are these red arrows. The point in time where stocks went from going straight up to going straight down. What changed? Well, when you think this through, you look at the data, and then you go back and actually read what was in newspapers at the time, like the Wall Street Journal, you see that what really changed was simply the narrative. A perfect example of this is if we go back to the Wall Street Journal in June of 2007, right around where this black arrow is. Now, at the time, they were right on the cusp of this huge move down, which many would say was a crash. So you would think in the mainstream media on CNBC and Bloomberg, they'd be talking about how right now the market is really risky and how right now the economy isn't doing well at all. So the probabilities would lean towards a bear market. But they were actually doing the exact opposite. Editor, let's get right to the internet. Good earnings out of Dell were the catalyst for stocks to head higher. All these deals continue to put a floor under the markets. Plus, the economy is looking pretty strong. Leading the day's economic news, the Labor Department said non-farm payrolls grew by a net 157,000 jobs in May, ahead of consensus expectations. The unemployment rate was unchanged at 4.5%, again in line with expectations, while average hourly earnings were up 0.3%. In other words, the labor market was pretty strong. In fact, unemployment rate right now, 4%. Back then, 4.5%, which is still below the long-term average. They go on to say, I think you can characterize today's batch of data as supporting the Goldilocks scenario. In other words, just the right levels of economic growth and inflation. And what I want to highlight is when they were saying the economy was strong, and the economy was perfect, just right, like Goldilocks, and the labor market is doing very, very well, it's not like we were right here in the cycle. No, 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 no. We were right here, <laughs> right at the point where the stock market started to implode and continued to go down all the way in to 2009. So how does this narrative shift change? And by the way, we saw the exact same thing in March of 2020 during the Cerveza sickness. If you guys go back and remember, in February, the market was going up and up and up and up, 
Because, oh my gosh, well, if anything does happen, well, that means the Fed's going to cut interest rates even further. And if they cut interest rates further, we all know that's great for the S&P 500. But then all of a sudden, the news gets worse and worse and worse. And we go from an environment where bad news is good news to bad news being bad news. And that's when the market usually falls out of bed. So what we have to watch for is early stages in the cycle, we see good news being good news. Now, late stages, like we're in right now, we see bad news being good news. So if we have bad economic data, well, this is fantastic because, again, that means the Fed is going to drop rates. It makes no sense whatsoever. Somehow you could rationalize that if the economy does worse and worse and worse, somehow that means the stock market, which should reflect what's happening in the economy, should do better and better and better. <laughs> and in hindsight, we look back and say, what on earth were people thinking? But it happens over and over and over again. So then the question becomes, what is the catalyst that creates this shift? When investors go from taking all their money, leveraging up their house, maxing out their credit card, taking every single dime they can get their hands on, and throwing that into the most risky assets in the market, because at the end of the day, everyone knows, YOLO, you only live once, to looking at the market and seeing it as a train wreck, a slow motion train wreck, and that car is going right off the cliff, and no, 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 I'm taking all my money out and putting it in a safer place. Well, there's a few things that drive the narrative in the mainstream media to change that investor psychology. First and foremost, we've got to look at the unemployment rate. When the unemployment rate starts to go up, this means people lose their jobs, obviously, and the labor market gets a lot softer. So psychologically, people naturally withdraw because they don't feel as though they have as much money or they will have as much purchasing power in the future. And if you combine this with asset prices starting to go down, you have this feedback loop where things just get worse and worse and worse. Let me show you what I'm referring to. I use this example all the time, but a healthy economy should be like a hot air balloon, where the balloon itself is the real economy, the production of goods and services. And the basket is just the financial markets. Let's say the S&P 500, the housing market, etc. So if the economy goes up and up and up and does better, well, you would assume that the financial markets or assets would do the exact same thing. And vice versa, if the economy does worse, then you would expect assets to do the same, have a price decline. But now we have financialized our economy to the degree to which it's the opposite. The balloon is actually assets. The basket is the economy. So in order for the economy to do well, asset prices have to continue to go up and up and up. But this visual actually doesn't tell the whole story. Let me show you what I mean. We're gonna go over to this red line, which represents a recession. So anything above the red line, and the economy is doing okay. Anything below the red line, the economy is in contraction. So again, going back to this example, if the economy starts doing poorly, you would expect financial markets to go down. But what has happened is we have this over-financialization of the economy. So financial markets go up and up and up, but they don't necessarily take the basket with it. Meaning that the hot air balloon goes up and up and up, but it's like the strings just get longer. And it just barely keeps the economy's head above water. So it doesn't take the economy up with it, it just barely keeps it out of recession. But at a certain point, the economy gets so bad that it drags financial markets down with it. That's when bad news goes to bad news. But then we get that positive feedback loop that because the economy is so dependent upon asset prices, when asset prices do go down, it makes the economy even worse than it otherwise would have been. So now let's try to answer the original question. When will stocks start to decline? When will we see a bear market? Or when will we possibly see the stock market even crash? It's all about reading the tea leaves. 
seeing the writing on the wall and watching what they're saying in the mainstream media. My good buddies over at the real estate guys, Robert and Russ, have a term for this. They call it clues in the news. So this is what I want to encourage you to do moving forward to try to get this timing right. Although at the end of the day, timing the tops and the bottoms are impossible. The only thing that you can really do is get the move in the middle. Just a moment ago, we looked at the Wall Street Journal from June of 2007. But now, let's fast forward a bit and go to August of 2008 after the S&P 500 had gone from roughly 15, 1600 all the way down to 1200 a drop of about 20% before it really hit the fan <laughs> and plummeted all the way down to that infamous 666 number. Editor, let's cut to the internet. GM was strung by strikes at major suppliers and collapsing truck and sport utility vehicle sales. In other words, what we see there is that retail spending was starting to decline significantly and really showing up in the data. After the labor market reported a decline of 51,000 jobs on non-farm payrolls in July, the decline represented the seventh straight month of job losses. And oil traders were seeing a recent report as a harbinger of possible changes in fuel demand. So now let's compare that to what we see in the news today, or the clues in the news today compared to what we saw back in 2008. So retail spending. I want to highlight an article that I just saw that showed gas prices are at an all-time low going back to 2021, but we're heading right into the driving season. You would expect the exact opposite. So this gives us a clue that retail spending could be declining. Let's also look at GM's most recent quarter when they saw declining sales of 1.5%. And let's not forget about the carnage that we have been seeing lately in the restaurant industry. Red Lobster went bankrupt. Boston Market is on the brink of bankruptcy. Rubio's is shutting down locations. I heard Applebee's is shutting down locations. No matter where you look, you see these iconic American restaurants, which we all know, probably a lot of us have eaten there, and they're either closing down or they're reporting that they're seeing demand plummet. And it's not just the mid-level sit-down restaurants that are experiencing significant difficulties. If you look at McDonald's, they're not closing stores, but they came out recently and saying they see the consumer is really pinched. Therefore, demand is going down. And it's places like Starbucks as well, and Pizza Hut, KFC. It's the exact same thing. And this is a clue, along with gas and what's happening with GM, that retail sales are starting to go down. In other words, aggregate demand from the consumer is starting to decline. But the real key here is to watch what happens with the unemployment rate and the payroll numbers. Now recently, the headline number, the establishment number has been very good, but when you kind of scratch beneath the surface, you see that uh, the labor market isn't so hot. And the headline number that the mainstream media latches onto is actually an outlier. But when you see those jobs reports really go negative, even the headline number, that's when you know the narrative is definitely going to shift. It's interesting, when you think about how this works, it's a little bit like getting overweight, where you can sit there, especially if all your buddies are overweight, and you say, oh, I'm not that bad, and you kind of look in the mirror and you, you loosen up the buttons on the, the suit jacket, or you loosen up the, the belt buckle a little bit, and you don't really think anything of it until you get to a point where something happens and it hits you all at once. You look in the mirror and you say, holy cow, I'm fat. <laughs> you come to the realization and then you get your butt in the gym 
and you got to do something about it. So whether your epiphany moment is just having to use a different hole in your belt, or maybe it's trying to bend over to tie your shoelaces and you're having some problems, whatever it is, it's the exact same thing. It happens slowly, 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 like going bankrupt, and then boom, all at once. But the key driver here, usually when we look at history, is the unemployment figures, the labor market, because that's when it's undeniable. And that's when the central banks start to cut rates, which, oh, by the way, if we look at last week, we see the Bank of Canada and the ECB did what? They started to drop rates. And editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of the Fed funds rate. And we go back over the last few recessions and we see that the cycle is the same. It plays out the exact same way over and over and over again. The Fed hikes rates, they pause, and then they start to drop. Once they drop, that's usually when we have the recession. And oh, by the way, that's usually when we have the most extreme drop in the S&P 500. So when you actually look at the clues that we're seeing in the mainstream media, in the data, this will help you determine when the narrative is shifting from bad news being good news to bad news being bad news. So although it's very difficult, if not impossible, to time when we're actually right here, you'll definitely know when we're right here. So using the GFC as a reference, you might not know when we're in June, July of 2007, but you'll definitely know when we're in August of 2008. Now, I know a lot of you right about now are saying to yourself, okay, George, I get what you're saying here, but what on earth do I do? Do I buy gold? Do I buy bonds? NVIDIA call options, maybe? On GameStop? <laughs> it's all so confusing. Well, the good news is I've got some answers for you. This Friday, I'm going to be doing a webinar for Rebel Capitalist Pro members. This is the investment membership site. I've got my good friends, Lynn Alden and Chris McIntosh. And this Friday, I'm going to go over my own personal portfolio. Now, this isn't paper trading. This is 100000 of my own dollars. And I'm disclosing all of this information with you. I'm sharing the secrets, if you will, of what I'm doing to help you make better decisions moving forward. So if you want to take part in this webinar, just go to georgegammon.com forward slash pro. You can do a $1 one-week trial. And I will see you this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern.